it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter today, Natasha Simons. Now, Natasha is probably known to many of you already, but to some of you may not be aware that Natasha joined ANS earlier this year, coming to us from Griffith University, where as a senior project specialist, uh, amongst many other things, she rolled out data citation at Griffith University. And that's going to be the topic of her presentation today. So thank you, and we'll hand over to Natasha. OK, so at Griffith University, we've been supporting data citation for quite some time now. We were the first institution um, to mint DOIs for our research data sets uh, using the AND Cite My Data service. And we went on to put a Cite My Data element into the Research Hub, which is our premier discovery service for all things Griffith Research. We also ran a project to engage with our researchers and our academic liaison librarians about data citation practices. So in this talk today, I'm going to share our journey with you, the warts and all, um, and I'm going to talk about what a data citation looks like, um, the minting of DOIs using the AND Cite My Data service, developing guidelines for minting and managing DOIs, um, some engagement strategies around data citation and the lessons that we've learnt on our journey. And there'll be time for questions at the end. So a little bit about Griffith to start with so that you can contextualise it. So Griffith is um, a medium-sized uh, university that's situated in um, South East Queensland. We have five campuses that are spread out from Brisbane to the Gold Coast. And we've got around 43,000 students for 4,300 staff and you can see from the list of schools and departments that we have um, basically four academic groups and they're quite diverse. So from arts through to business, health and then science, environment, engineering and technology. For our research we also have 32 um, research centres and a whole lot of priority areas that are quite diverse. So you can see in there we've got sustainable tourism, physical sciences, nursing, Asian politics. So we're very cross-disciplinary um, at our institution. We have in place some good research infrastructure um, for research data management. Um, we are very fortunate to have a strong commitment from our university um, leaders to improving data management. And we also have had, as a result of that, some staff resources that have been allocated to important things to do with research data management at an operational level, um, but also at a contract project level. And Griffith has been quite successful in seeking funds from ANS and also from Nectar and other, other external sources to build um, our own infrastructure and contribute to national infrastructure around data management. Um, and we have had that strong emphasis on also seeking internal funds. So our research hub, for example, was um, built initially with a spark of funding from ANS, which we then contributed more than what ANS had contributed to build our research hub and really significantly invested in that as a resource, not just for managing data, but for profiling our researchers as well. Um, and we have policy frameworks and service mo models for data management um, under discussion as well. So what does a data citation look like? Well, this is our research hub, which probably a lot of you have already seen because we have talked a lot about it. Um, so the research hub is built on Vivo, uh, open source software, and it was built in-house at Griffith. And it's our researcher profile system that gives profile page for researchers but also connects everything. So it connects a researcher to their publications, their data collections, um, their grants and so forth and has landing pages for those things within it. So this is a profile page for Associate Professor Rodney Stewart um, and you'll see a number of tabs underneath his photograph. Um, there's overview publications projects and I've got it defaulted in the screen on the collections tab. So you can see that he is the owner of a number of data sets to do with South East Queensland domestic water usage. So there, if you click on those, one of those, you open up the collection in the research hub. And that is because um, we've worked on a gold standard project that was funded by ANS at Griffith. We have some nice metadata for this particular record to describe this data collection. If you then scroll further down um, this record, you get to Right at the bottom there, you can see cite this collection. 
So that's what the data citation looks like. It's got the creator names and the date that the data set was published, the data set title, and the producer of the data set. And then there's also a DOI link that, that is a persistent identifier that links through to the data set. And people can copy and paste that cite this collection. So if somebody, a researcher, uses this collection and they want to cite that data in their research, then they can copy and paste that cite this collection feature into their, um, into their reference list for their article. OK, how is data cited? Um, so that's one example of how data could be cited. Um, I'm going to speak from personal experience here. Um, using my own example, mostly because <laughs> it enables me to talk about it in detail. Um, but uh, a couple of years ago, I conducted a research project with my colleague Joanna Richardson on um, the training needs of repository staff. And it involved data collection through a national survey. We then had the article published in the Journal of Librarianship and Scholarly Communication. And while the peer review process was going on for the article, we put the data set in our institutional repository and we used the Cite My Data service to mint a DOI for it. And we then provided a little citation reference to the Journal of Librarianship and Scholarly Communication and they put it in the supplemental content. So if you scroll, that's just scrolling down from that previous top record at their website and you'll see supplemental content and it's got identifying skill sets for repository staff, data file, and survey questions. And if you click on that DOI link, you will you have to do a few extra clicks, but you will get through to the actual data set and the survey questions. And right at the bottom there is the recommended citation for the article. So that's not to be confused. The supplemental content is the data set and the recommended citation is actually for the article. So that gives you an example of what a really nice workflow is and how the Dryad data repository works um, in terms of the workflow for people publishing their data sets, getting the citation and including a link to the data set in the article when it's published. So it's an example. Um, so now I'm going to talk about our journey into how we were able to get to this point. Um, so what do you need to pack if you're going on a data citation journey? Well, there are really only two things that you need before you start your journey. First of all, you need some research data collections at your institution that have open, embargoed or mediated access. So you obviously don't apply DOIs or data citation to data sets which are private or closed because no one's going to cite them. Secondly, you need a publicly available metadata record that, descri that describes each of these collections and provides access to them or advice about how you can access to them how you can access them. So you can see that data citation actually comes further down the track after you've done some management of the research data resource. So at Griffith we had, um, we have a research data repository um, that's built on Equella software um, and it hosts our data collections, the files as well as the metadata. And we also have a research hub uh, which I've explained, and the Research Hub draws metadata records automatically from our research data repository along with a number of other sources. So the data repository is feeding the Research Hub and the Research Hub is the main um, discovery service for, for our data collections and for our researchers and for the research. So on your journey you might also need managed support. And I've given you some pictures there so you can see um, what we've had at Griffith. So you might need management support to do things like approve the commencement of your data citation journey, um, to assign resources to carry it out, to review and approve related policy workflows and guidelines, um, to sign the forms that you need signed to use the Cite My Data service, and to be an advocate of what you're trying to do. Um, you will probably also need technical support because you need to develop a technical script um, to mint DOIs, but don't be scared off by that because it's, it's not very complex and there's, we've made ours available for reuse if anyone wants to use that. Um, and you need technical support to mint and manage the DOIs over time as well. Um, and to create the citation element display in your discovery service. So just to give you a bit of a picture that these when and why DOI, that it didn't actually happen overnight for us. Um, we've actually been doing this for a while, as I mentioned. So um, in August 2011, we started thinking about persistent identifiers and 
I wrote a um, PIDS is persistent identifier, so PIDS for data options paper, which recommended that we adopt DOIs. And then in August, at the same time, ANS launched the Site My Data Service pilot. And we were able to get agreement from our management to um, actually go ahead with joining the pilot and becoming guinea pigs. And um, then September to December, we started um, developing our machine-to-machine -machine scripts and started minting DOIs for our collections. Um, I can't remember exactly what month it was, but around May of 2012, we put a site list collection feature into the Griffith Research Hub. And October, we commenced a data citation project. And by that, I mean this was our outreach project to go out and talk about data citation to our researchers and to trial some data citation products like the Thomson Reuters Data Citation Index. And then in 2013, um, that project concluded in May. And in September, we produced our own DOI guidelines, which we've also made available. And I'm going to talk about them a bit later. And we developed a roadmap for where we want to go with our, um, with our research data management and also with our DOIs and data citation. So when we first looked at DOIs, we weren't actually thinking data citation right at the start. We were thinking we needed a persistent identifier and we needed that to fill gaps in persistent identifiers for scholarly works. So we had, um, uh, long and incomprehensible URLs for metadata in our um, data repository, and they're still there if you want to take a look. They're pretty ugly, and we needed a persistent identifier that was that would be short and easy to read, and that would signal long-term management for our research data collections. We also needed a persistent identifier that would contribute to the semantic vision for um, data in the research hub, and by filling in gaps for persistent identifiers for scholarly works, I mean we had persistent identifiers for publications through our institutional um, publications repository, but we didn't have persistent identifiers for our data collections, for our theses, and for our grey literature like unpublished reports and conference papers, and any policy documents that don't go to ERA or HERDSE, but that we want to make available for people to discover. And also other digital objects like a video lecture with link to research projects and so forth. So later on, um, we needed it as a foundation for data citation as well. So we chose DOIs to meet our needs for a number of reasons. First of all, because they are a global persistent identifier that are already used in many scholarly publications. So Crossref issue DOIs for publications and they're used in many journal articles. Um, also because DOIs can be assigned to research data, theses, grey literature and even software code now um, using DataCite as the registration agency and that is the registration agency that you will use when you use the ANS Site My Data service. We also um, needed DOIs to improve the visibility of and access to research data and it gave us a responsibility for managing persistent access to our data collections. So when you mint DOIs, you are also making a commitment to um, maintain access to at least the metadata page of your data collections. And if that page changes, like you get a new repository software and it gets a new web page for your data, well, you need to update the DOI with that URL. So it signals that you're going to maintain these um, data collections over time, not just sort of have a transitory thing. So it also DOIs won't break the institutional repository uh, software. DOIs won't break when institutional <laughs> repository software is re-indexed. Sorry about that. Um, because handles sometimes do if you re-index software in your repository and DOIs won't break. And later we needed DOIs because they facilitate data citation. They greatly assist in tracking the impact of data sets through the collection of metrics and alt metrics which use the DOI. So the ANS Site My Data Service provided a partnership with an international DOI registration agency, which is DataCite. They provided minting DOI for metadata records about open mediated or embargoed research data, theses, grey literature and software. We haven't done the software part yet, but I know the CSIRO have just begun to do that, which is great. It's a machine to machine workflow um, and there's an easily achieved small amount of metadata that is required to mint a DOI. 
You can also trial it in a safe test environment. There's a lot of high level documentation provided and um, there's a lot of information about data citation on the ANS website and also it's free. So this is why some of the reasons why we decided to become the first guinea pigs to cite my data service. How does it work? This is to give you an idea of the workflows. So you sign an agreement to use the Cite My Data service. ANS give you an institutional um, ID. You prepare your machine-to-machine -machine script. Um, and in your script, you're going to include the required metadata for each, for minting each DOI, which you will already have because you've got metadata for your data set. So it's very easy. The metadata is uh, data set title, creator, publisher, publication year, and identifier. And the identifier is actually the landing page for the metadata of your data set, so a URL or a URI. You execute the script against the Site My Data service, and the Site My Data service returns the DLIs. And you can store the DLIs in your own system and use that to create a citation element which you can display in your discovery service. And you can also feed that citation element in your RIFCS feed um, back to ANS for display in Research Data Australia. So as an example of our scripts, we've got um, a Python script that uh, you are most welcome to use. It's available on GitHub and the link is there if you'd like to read it. So we minted DOIs, but it actually raised a whole lot of questions. Um, so it was the actually machine to machine technical part was quite easy, but there are a number of questions uh, that arose like, what's the criteria for assigning a DOI to a research collection? Um, at what level of granularity should a DOI be applied? Is it just for collection level items or is it for items within a collection, like a collection of, of film and then you have a DOI for each film within the collection or what? Also, should the DOI link to the landing page for the actual data or should it link to a metadata page? Which landing page for us? It was, was it the research hub? Um, was it the research data repository? And what if the data's changed or updated, like a new wave of data is added or a spelling mistake is made and then corrected? Should a new DOI be issued? Should researchers be able to mint the DOI or should we mint it for them? And how are DOIs assigned if the research data is the result of a collaboration between various institutions who can all do DOI minting? If a group of university researcher collaborates with someone from the University of Sydney, who gets the data set? who mints the DOI, because theoretically there should be one DOI for the data collection. And what happens to the DOIs we've minted if ANS closes shop? Um, and finally, can you cite data without a DOI? Mm -hmm. So we, um, I, I wrote these questions up in an article called Implementing DOIs for Research Data in DLib. And that's freely available if anyone wants to read it. Um, we've actually learnt a lot since that time. Um, and we've answered most of those questions satisfactorily, although the one about collaboration I think is still quite difficult. Um, and I think TURN, uh, Terrestrial Ecosystems Research Network, has actually got the best experience in, the, in that particular area. And we haven't had that actual question arise, arise just yet. Um, but to answer a couple of those questions, so um, we decided our uh, the, the DOI does need to link to a metadata page and for us that metadata page is our discovery service, the research hub. If the data is changed with a new wave of data, yes, you should actually create a new DOI. Um, can you start data without a DOI? Yes, you can, um, but it's certainly beneficial to have one um, and I'll talk about why later. I've already mentioned a few reasons. Um, and what happens to the DOIs we have minted if ANS closes shop? Well, of course, they are still maintained because DataCite is the registration agency used, and that's international. And that's going to close shop anytime soon. Um, so the questions and uh, um, answers that we found, we wrote up in our Digital Object Identifiers Introduction and Management Guide, and I've put a link there if you'd like to read them or adapt them yourself. Um, also, ANS helped us answer some of those questions um, because there was a very good community of practice around DOIs and data citation that ANS facilitated. And it wasn't just Griffith asking questions, there were other institutions coming up with the same sort of sticky, sticky questions. And 
you know, we had quite a lot of um, events, workshops and online discussions about this and the ANS DOI FAQs have answered a lot of those questions. And we also documented our experiences of minting DOIs in the Gold Standard blog, which is now closed because that project is closed, but the blog's still there if anyone wants to read some of the painful experiences but the good ones that we had too along that particular journey. Um, so once we'd done the DOIs, we put the site list collection feature in the Research Hub and we fed it through to Research Data Australia. So in this particular record, it's the same collection as the previous page and you can see how to cite this collection uh, there in the Research Data Australia service. So um, just some discovery services that are useful on your data citation journey to know about. So Thomson Reuters has launched a data citation index and ANS is negotiating for Research Data Australia data sets to go in the data citation index for discovery. And that uh, also you can link from ANS, you can actually link, log into your ORCID ID and link your Research Data Australia data set in your ORCID profile. And on the top right there, you'll see there's a video about how you can do that. It's very easy to do. On the bottom right, there's a little snapshot of one of the Griffith records in the data site content service. That's the, so once you mint the DOI, because it's um, done through data site, you can actually search for that um, through the data site search service. And that has driven a little bit of traffic to the research hub too, which, which um, was unexpected and, and we're quite pleased about. Um, so it's just more ways to expose your data, I suppose. And also I've put the altmetric um, badge there because DOIs are really important in being able to collect metrics and citation metrics for your research data sets. So to talk briefly about our engagement experiences. Um, so after we'd done that, we decided we went on this project to talk to our researchers about data citation or a select number of researchers really, just it's a trial. Um, so we established a blog for this particular project, which again has now closed because the project is closed, but the blog's open if you'd like to read some of our experiences there. So we did things like um, we spoke with our um, academic liaison librarians about citation practices in different disciplines. And we included data citation as part of some standard consultations with a group in health and an individual in environmental economics. So it's a relatively small portion of, of Griffith um, liaison librarians that were involved in this and also of um, Griffith researchers. We looked at what kind of workflows we could set up um, and uh, we're looking at how to incorporate those workflows into our new research data repository that we're building to replace the current one so that um, you know you get an email when you're when you've lodged a collection saying here's a citation you can use in your article or wherever to, to cite this data now that you've registered your collection in the research data repository. And we reviewed our existing information and workflows um, around Griffith policies and procedures, academic style guides, training materials and so forth. And we included data citation in the best practice guidelines for researchers managing research data and primary materials. And I need to acknowledge that um, the work of my colleague Sam Searle was really critical in this, it, she led this particular project on the engagement strategies. So the lessons we learnt through this project is that one size won't um, fit all and it's important to be aware that there are major differences across the disciplines that you would be likely to encounter in a university like Griffith. So we've talked a little bit about style guides um, which are generally don't talk um, this is citation style guides, don't generally mention data. Um, but in discussing citation practices with some of our subject librarians, it became obvious that there are many other factors that would make a researcher more or less open to a discussion about how data might contribute to the impact of their research. And this could include the types of publishing outlets, their target audiences and the processes by which their work is currently assessed. So we also observed some differences in a fairly unscientific way really that seem to do um, really with the age and career stage of the person that you're talking to. So more than ever, younger uh, early career researchers need to build a profile 
um, and seem to be more prepared to investigate non-traditional ways of getting their research out there. And that was also a lesson we learnt um, through launching our research hub project, that those early career work researchers where they had a profile, they were the ones who were most enthusiastic about um, keeping it up to uh, about you know embellishing it, adding things to it, making sure that they looked very very good in their profile. So in working with the group of health researchers, um, we observed that the people who maintained the most interest in the possibilities of data collections being cited were the postdocs, um, not the more senior staff members. Another lesson we learnt was um, to choose your time, so um, and to, to be able to find hooks with researchers. So unfortunately at Griffith, we don't have any way of knowing when a researcher is going to publish their data. We still get our data collections incidentally when someone comes to us with data or where there's a particular project where we're collecting those data sets. And that makes it very hard because it means we could get a data set after um, an article has been published that the data set has informed and therefore how do, does the person then put the citation to their data in that article if it's already been published. So ideally, an ideal kind of workflow is that, you know, uh, is the one that I described earlier where while the peer review process goes in, somebody um, goes on, somebody submits their data set, gets the data citation and then puts it in the article that way. And that, that is the, the nice um, workflow that Dryad, Dryad have. So we've done our best um, our best to find other hooks um, and the, the first is data deposit and notifications that can be automated ar around that and we've tried this and during the course of the project we minted DOIs for 14 newly deposited collections and sent the notification email to the researchers similar to the one in the Dryad workflow and these uh, data collections were being identified for deposit again after the end of the projects and the final reports had mostly already been published but it was still slightly disappointing to not get a response from the researchers over this communication. Um, so we also thought it was better to have a need to know basis around DOIs. So we were interested to hear that other organisations are taking an approach in, in which the minting of DOIs is by request. We'd interpret this to mean that it is necessary for a researcher to know what a DOI is and to have at least a basic understanding of why they might want one. But our view is that the assignment of a persistent identifier to publicly accessible collections has benefits above and beyond those that might accrue to the data collection owners through citation. And making the minting of DOIs as uh, a rules-driven rather than demand-driven exercise should remove the need to communicate specifically about DOIs and citation before a DOI is actually generated. So we would still want to include DOIs in the context of full citation information on display pages and in notifications and various kinds of training and information resources, but the researchers shouldn't have to understand the ins and outs of DOIs in order to make a decision about whether they should have one or not. So we also think it's important to be honest and realistic with researchers and be careful to not oversell the benefits of DOIs and data, well, the benefits of data citation. Um, so there's still a relatively small body of literature around the benefits and yeah, because they're researchers, they're going to ask about it and we really need more research to be done in this area, not just in one discipline, but in other disciplines as well, um, to make our case stronger. And it's good that that is happening. So here is um, an, uh, a quote from an article that um, was in PJ recently from Heather Pivoa. And she says that previous studies have found that papers with publicly available data sets receive a higher number of citations than similar studies without available data. We find a robust citation benefit from open data, although a smaller one than previously reported. We conclude that there's a direct effect of third party uh, data reuse that persists for years beyond the time when researchers have published most of the papers reusing their own data. So this is really about um, data reuse and publications, but it's really selling the advantage of having open data and allowing it to be citable. And just mention here that Heather Pivoa is actually going to be one of the keynotes at the eResearch Australasia conference this year in Melbourne, if you can make it along to that. Um, and our fifth lesson was not everything can be solved now or by you alone. So 
it feels messy because you know we all like things to end neatly and for all of our questions to be answered but it's really not possible to be able to do that so you'll see in this guide that um, the white uh, circles are collective action that's needed for change in these areas that's not just us at Griffith but is actually everybody really so things like a change in funder mandates around data um, publisher policies around data saying that which are starting to change so we know that FOSS and Nature are requiring data now as part of their publications so um, when these change then you've got more of a case for people to work for researchers more of a motivation for researchers to do proper data management and to be able to get the citation and cite their, da cite their data set in their publication we also need changes to style guides for citations to include data and tools like EndNote and Zotero um, to include the ability to add data sets, um, which I think it's End Zotero that recently made that adjustment. Um, and research quality exercises too, which look at um, the reportability of data. Um, so in the pink boxes we've got investigate things that we're investigating um, now and in the near future which is things like information and training for our uh, librarians and also for our researchers bibliometrics and altmetrics and in the slightly red box we've got we mostly know what we're doing with these so we mostly know about identify our registration agencies and DOIs we've got a data repository and institutional procedures around data so we wrote some of our experiences up in a DLEV article, um, and which is also openly available. And um, we did do a more extensive um, webinar on this when we first finished the data citation outreach project. And there's a link there if you'd like to watch that, because that has more on um, our experiences with digital strategies. I'm sorry to say that we did well, but we didn't conquer the world. And on the to-do list are things like embedding DOIs in automated data collection workflows. So someone submits a data set and they automatically get a DOI and a, as part of a data citation email that comes out automatically from our data repository. Um, we'd also like to mint DOIs for grey literature for things like our theses, reports, discussion papers and so forth. We know we can do it, um, but we need to be able to do that. Um, we need to improve the link between research publications and underlying data. So we have the ability to capture that in the research hub, but again, we can't really do that if data publishing is not yet routine at the institution. Um, we we'll also need to review our DOI guidelines, rules and workflows at future points in time and embed types of metadata such as coins into landing pages so that people can import that into citation tools. So finally, just some reflections on our experience. So I think it's important to do what you can with what you have available to you. Um, and the technical minting and maintaining of DOIs is relatively easy and something that, you know, if you've got those metadata records and you've got your open, mediated or embargo data collections, then you can mint DOIs and you can start looking at putting the site my Cite my data um, element into your discovery service and research data Australia. Um, so getting the citation element is as easy as getting the cite my data service up. Um, and there's also a lot of materials available now on DOIs um, that is setting up DOI minting and maintaining. And there's a lot of material on data citation which is aimed at researchers and um, research data managers. So don't you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, and I think as guinea pigs, we did <laughs> actually go through a lot of this and would be really pleased if people can reuse any of the things that we did so that you don't actually have to start right at the beginning. Um, so you could decide, so the ANS is a machine to, and Site My Data Service is machine to machine, but you could set up an administrator in, interface for minting and maintaining DOIs. So that would be if you want your librarian, for example, to um, be able to mint a DOI without requesting the script from the technical, without basically liaising with technical support to be able to do that. Um, and TURN have actually done this and they have made that 
um, I believe that they've made that code open, open source. Um, but you know, you'd have to have an investment into being able to do that um, because that um, front end would run over the top of the machine to machine scripts in the background. It's basically a humanly readable interface um, that a librarian or research data manager could use to ma maintain the DOIs. Also, establishing workflows for DOIs and data citation is not easy if you don't know when your researchers are going to publish their data and if data publication is not routine. I've talked about that in a bit more detail. Um, and data citation is not yet common practice, but there is a large international community supporting data citation, um, both as a principle and to encourage practice in this area. Um, and there's a growing body of evidence on the positive link between open data and citation counts that we use in your arguments toward um, promoting data citation with your researchers. So I'm going to leave it there. Oh, thank you so much, Natasha. That was absolutely fantastic and a lot of content there. So I'd like to take this opportunity to um, thank Natasha once again for a fantastic presentation.